Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Data Engineering Show. Woo! So happy to see you again. Yes, yes. So Came back from abroad. I missed you, I missed you so much. Uh, so yeah, welcome to another episode where we host uh, data practitioners from all around. Uh, today with us, Roy Miara. Did I pronounce it correctly, Roy? Yeah. Great. So, so Roy, an engineering manager at a super interesting uh, company called Explorium, engineering, engineering manager of data and ML, uh, who's been uh, in a variety of data engineering and machine learning focused roles, a uh, variety of startups uh, in his career. And, and typically, you know, we talk to, you know, big brand names before, but it's important to also talk to sometimes smaller and interesting companies. Emerging like, brands. Like Explorium. So companies that actually build stuff for data engineers and data scientists, uh, which makes Explorium interesting. So Explorium, if you haven't heard about them, uh, recently landed 75 million in investment. But what they do, what they do, what they do, uh, they help with data enrichment uh, and help you sort of use external and public data sources to simplify your training data uh, procedures and stuff like that. We'll have uh, Roy expand on that a little bit. But before that, Actually, Roy ran late a little bit. Roy, why did you run late to this webinar? I think you have a story for us. Changing a flat tire. Ah. For whom? Uh, for a pregnant woman. This is the- so nice. Yeah. Sometimes we have people who are also amazing <laughs> humans outside of the data engineering show. Thank you for helping. And your with, wife uh, is not expecting. I had no, it's not my wife. I had a feeling because I was texting Boaz and then I said, ah, he's going to, he's going to pop. <laughs> so, yeah. so. so take example from Roy if you see pregnant people who need to change flat tires in the heat uh, help them out okay so Roy tell us a little bit about uh, Explorium in your own words please so Explorium um, so there is this emerging um, uh, among among uh, data scientists today, we heard we hear a lot that it's all about the data. It's no more about the models. It's not more about this is the era of data centric AI in general. And you know, big data analytics has always been around data. Who has the best data? Who is the the most accurate? Or the the most relevant data um, to answer some business questions. And in Explorium, we're looking at this whole world of machine learning and and big data analytics, and we say. It's all about having the right data. So what Explorium does, it enables uh, organization, large organizations, more organizations, um, um, to have access, immediate access, um, to the most relevant data for their business problem. Um, And we do it by obviously um, aggregating a lot of data sources in a lot of fields, modeling uh, modeling the data correctly, um, and enabling this kind of search engine over our uh, our data set with accordance to what the cust- we, you know what the user has and already has as an internal data from this company um, but also in cases where the user don't don't even have a data and only has some business question uh, he wants to know all the companies that uh, you know has more than 10 employees and more than five million dollars in capital in the East Coast, for example. So who are typically are the end users? Is it more for data engineers, data scientists? Is it sometimes for business users as well? So yeah, we see, um, so our users span from data scientists and like deep ML uh, engineers on the one, on the like, the, on, the le- on the far end. And, and on, the, on the other hand, you have people, you know, from business and analytics side that use the platform um, to do all their exploratory uh, data analysis. Um, so yeah, we see and everything in between, obviously. Okay, so we're talking about a company that manages a lot of data, makes it easily accessible, both for engineering and for a business. Super interesting. So tell us a bit about, you know, just so we can understand the data challenges you guys have. So what data volumes, more or less, are you guys dealing with? So data volume here is tricky because... Uh, so. We're processing somewhere around the two terabytes a day. But when I'm saying processing, I'm talking about already structured tabular data. So we're not looking into raw data. So we're looking at fine grain, like high quality data. 
um, from a lo- variety of sources. And I think the challenge here is like one of our major challenges is having this variety of sources and different schemas and, and you know, constantly evolving. Um, so around a couple of terabytes a day, um, this is what we process. Um, and in volume, so we, we're talking also a couple of hundreds of terabytes, um, constantly updating. And, uh, and is that like one data source? Is that one global schema with many tables in it? Like, no, as- like hundreds of, hundreds of different sources. Most of them are structured. Um, but we're, we're talking hundreds of data sources, thousands of features or, or thousands of different schemas. Because uh, from every source, you know, we, we generate and aggregate data to many, many different use cases. Tell us a little bit, you know, because Xorm is a company where the data is the product, essentially. How does mm-hmm. the, you know, split between engineering data teams, data engineering sort of look like? So maybe give us an overview of, engin- you know, how many people are in engineering, how many people deal with data, how many people have a data-related title versus an engineering-related title. Uh, do, engin- do, do people without an engineering title, essentially, also, without a data title, still work on data stuff? It's a good, it's a good question, actually, because everybody. I claim that everybody here are data engineers, scientists, and analysts, kind of make... Um, so we have, uh, like an infrastructure organization, data infrastructure, which is the team that I'm leading, um, nine, uh, we're about nine data engineers, data ops engineer, ML engineers. So we kind of work in between. Uh, we have another team that's kind of building experience feature store to say. So a user can just add a, a one of many data sources uh, that are completely structured into their schema, into their model, enrich it and, 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 and query it, basically. So we have these two flows, right? So one flow, what we call the AutoML flow, uh, the ML engine. So in this flow, a user is coming uh, with his data set, internal data that he collects in, internally inside his, uh, inside his organization. Um, and he has some target um, that he wishes to predict, um, like the classical ML flow. And what happens at that point, it can connect to our platform. And basically, the platform will enrich um, automatically. So add sources automatically according to the, the context and the analysis of the original core data set that the user uploaded. So the, the platform will automatically um, analyze the data, understand which data sets are um, the most relevant, connect them, train a model, evaluate the model based on how much uh, gain do we see from those external features. Um, so it's running, uh, so it's connecting the data, it's running feature extraction, it's running feature selection, closes the loop with a model, um, and then finds the best, uh, the best features according to the, the target. So this is what we call the auto ML, ML engine flow. Um, and we have additional, like we have a, a, um, a, a flow that is more towards general um, like you know analysis meaning that uh, you can upload your data we analyze the data obviously um, but we will present some our internal catalog um, of features so you'd be able to see the sources you'll be able to see the coverage you'll be able to see the features with uh, um, with all the description and everything and the user can add features so add enrichments uh, he can run transformations and basically build what we call the recipe. So we could build a recipe of the features that he wants to add with all the transformation. And then uh, he can query this recipe in production. He can use uh, this uh, recipe to schedule uh, batch jobs that periodically will update his data. Um, and now we're, we're kind of connecting all of these flows together to create one unified flow where you know, a model is just a part of the of a recipe, right? And what does your data stack look like? Um, so our data stack is quite varied. We have a couple of internal internally built tools. Um, our feature store is internally built. Um, but uh, what my team is uh, is managing in terms of um, so looking in the entire data stack. So we're looking at databases. Um, 
Postgres, Dynamo, um, we have Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the main databases that we have. We have Cloud Data Warehouse. So we are using Firebolt for a lot of our uh, internal processing and also for uh, exposing some of the data directly to the users. Um, uh, we're using Spark, obviously, a lot. We're using DBT. Um, so we're trying to be very on the, on the edge of the technology because we're facing with new use cases all the time. We kind of have this challenge of tr trying to be good with any data. So we kind of have to be familiar with any type of, of warehouse, any type of lake architecture, any type of... Uh, so you have to keep, like, keep track with, with what's happening. So this is a big part of what we do is try to understand what, where is the data engineering world is going because this is where also our users and customers are going. By the way, did you try the uh, new latest uh, DBT Spark integration? Any feedback on that? Where? In like a, so we have tried it. Um, we're actually trying it as we speak. So this is something nice. that we're building. Yeah, it's working nicely. We also ran it uh, based on Presto. Which work uh, nicely, and uh, you know, I'm I'm hearing integrations are coming also from your end, so we will be trying that as well, obviously. Um, so yeah, I mean, as as a feedback, I I love this tool. I think this is the the way to go. Um, for us, it's been like a, you know, very fitting because of of the variety and the constant need to create more pipelines and other complexities and to orchestrate everything and to have it in a way that, you know, we kind of democratize it among data scientists and analysts, both internally and externally in a way. Um, so you kind of have to have a unified layer where, 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 you know, engineers can sleep in their beds quietly at night without, you know, having to worry, waking up on pipelines breaking over schema changes, stuff like that. So, yeah. So let's do a, a quick... Uh uh, switch to a fun blitz round, which in which uh, we will uh, ask you a variety of questions where you're not supposed to mm -hmm. think too much, that just answer quickly. There are no wrong <laughs> answers, <laughs> but only yes or no. There, there are no yeah, only yes there are or no. no wrong answers, only except the ones that are wrong. Okay. Uh, okay. So, are you ready? Yeah. Commercial or open source? Open source and commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Batch or streaming? Uh, batch. Streaming is mini batching. Uh, write your own SQL or use a drag and drop with tool? Write a SQL. Come on. Work, work from home or from the office? Office. AWS, GCP, or Azure? Ah, oh, wow. Um, hopefully all of them, but AWS, GCP. To DBT or not to DBT? Although, you know, I think you, you hinted. Not to DBT, He's always to DBT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to Delta Lake or not to Delta Lake? Delta Lake. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, you know, Roy answered differently than typically. Yes, I think you're the first uh, one who said like from the office, like home or office. Yes. There's a word. Everyone was confused. Uh, People typically say yeah. either home or both. Yeah. Nobody just says office, except Roy. How many kids do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, so actually I have one. I have one. Right now we're living in a very small apartment, so working from home is super hard. But I, I also, I mean, I have uh, like, I, I like the fact that office is where you work and home is where you live. And old school. Yeah, old school. Old school. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, so what you know? What were some of the bigger you know data challenges or bigger projects you guys had at Explorium in the Tra last year? Traumas, huge success, huge surprise. As I said before, one of the biggest challenges I think that we have is that we kind of have to be good at any data, with any data, you know. So um, the platforms and the, uh, and the infrastructure that we build has to be kind of generalized from inception, um, which is hard. And, you know, most of engineering organization, and, and I know, and, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that also your engineering organization is trying to build the right thing and, and you know, not generalize too early 
and not try to, you know, have the wrong abstractions over thing. But we kind of have to, because in a way, if we're not abstracting in the right way, or if we're not generalizing enough, then with any new source that we find, we kind of have to tweak everything around it. So we can, so this is one big challenge I think that we have. Um, one other challenge that I think is interesting is um, that you kind of have to understand your user when, when he uploads, if you look at the auto ML flow, for example, when the user uploads his data, um, you have the challenge of understanding exactly what he's searching for and exactly what, what, he data, what his data means. And th that's one challenge. And also what, what he's actually searching for. Um, because sometimes you'd be surprised. It's not the you know the features that bring the most correlation sometimes it brings more knowledge right mm -hmm. sometimes knowledge is important when when you're doing the, where, when you're doing those analysis so we have users coming to us and say this is an interesting feature okay it's not always with the highest correlation to a target it's not always with the best statistics but it's interesting because it tells me something about my business that i didn't know mm -hmm. Um, so this is another challenge, um, and uh, democratizing this data platform that we build, um, this is also a big challenge because you have to enable data scientists, both in Explorium and outside, and data analysts to actually, you know, work with high volumes of data, complex pipelines, um, and be able to, you know, kind of build their own processing pipelines and features um, and you kind of have to enable them and abstract them from the engineering underneath. So you asked before about DBT on top of Spark. So I think the cool thing is that, you know, you're just writing SQL queries um, and underneath it runs on hundreds of machines on, on Spark, Instant, you know. This is amazing, so, you know. I remember the days, there weren't, like, it wasn't long ago where people were so excited about Scala and Java and, 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 and writing those Spark jobs and owning the, the threads and the machines and the hardware and the wiring. And it was all poof, it was all, it was all gone. I, th I think part of that, or maybe a big part of that is, is cloud native data warehouses like Snowflake and BigQuery uh, that actually kind of uh, taught many of us that it's okay to abstract, to simplify, and it's okay to have that decoupled from your day to day. So thank you, Snowflake and... Uh, and BigQuery for teaching Databricks that SQL is good. And yeah, and now we see everyone, uh, many, you know, many, many, many people we talk to, they're using, uh, they're using SQL over, over uh, Spark. That's kind of the, the biggest change we're seeing, moving from developing it to actually declaring it using SQL. And yeah, as you said, you love it, and, and most people do love it, and it's a good change. SQL is back. Uh, we were confused for a few years. We had no SQL. We had new SQL. We had side SQL. <laughs> and and that, uh, now yeah, SQL this, is back. This is the longest SQL rant I've heard. Exactly. And it's important to rant about it. Okay. So, you know, this is all exciting stuff. Let's talk about it from a more maybe personal perspective. Tell us about, you know, something that didn't go well. Tell us about what we call an epic failure uh, that you guys sort of ran into. Maybe an approach that didn't work well, lessons learned and such. I have a personal failure, so I'm going to talk about my personal one um, to own it. Um, so when I started Explorium, I, so you asked before, a batch versus streaming. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, uh, when I started Explorium, one of the things that um, was kind of clear to me is that we need to have this kind of stream ingest, complex stream ingest, that we will have to report some events from different because we're working with such a variety of sources, some of them are more dynamic by nature, right? So kind of APIs, for example. Um, and we have many of those, and we needed some way to kind of um, dynamically um, both enrich using those APIs and then propagate the data again to the data lake and kind of re-ingest it and reprocess it. And, you know, um, so I was uh, building this... Uh, wonderful Kafka-based streaming uh, connector for everything, you know, with the uh, best abstraction in the world. And uh, it flunked. Abstraction is slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate, but, uh, but you know, you got to learn. 
You gotta learn the hard way. Always. Uh, and remind yeah, yourself it, once in a while. No, but, but why, you know, why didn't it work? It was a premature obstruction in a way. Um, and it didn't uh, match kind of the way that uh, now we're looking at processing is that um, we have so many processes running offline mm -hmm. because um, we have to do this complex modeling and you know uh, kind of connect different sources into one knowledge that we do um, which you know happens obviously offline in batch jobs uh, and 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 it's very important to have you know to, to, to be able to support quality at scale mm -hmm. so quality data quality is one of our team's priority and and kind of challenges that uh, um, how do you maintain quality of a, such a variety of data sources um, and there isn't really a good way to provide super blazing fast latency um, with, along with quality because there are there is some processing that you have to do um, behind the scenes um, and so the, the streaming report was a bit premature And now when we're looking at streaming, we're looking at streaming as, a, as additional, you know, kind of entry point to those periodic jobs that can run or, or you know, more batch type of jobs that can run. Uh, but, and look at streaming as, as kind of a, just, an, just another way to get data into our lakes, warehouses, and mm -hmm. process, and, and then, you know, from there to processing. And I think so what you're saying is I might stream data in, stream on write, but it's always batch on read because the most, the batchest uh, 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 part of the schema will make all the streaming ones batches. So, and, and, and yeah, so streaming is, is a one way ticket and then you start you need to analyze yeah, stuff. We, we and, see uh, it often, often we yeah. see streaming, you know, as just the way I put data in my lake or whatever. But it doesn't mean that end users really enjoy that streaming and that low latency of the data coming in. Sometimes we see that, but definitely it's actually rarer, rarer than more well, We have the most, you know, it's a, for a lot of cases, we have updated um, um, live data, right? For example, take weather, okay? Mm -hmm. Weather is something that, first of all, you know, how much history of weather do you keep and how, and how you do it? So with whether we work with APIs, for example, that when we users, and of, obviously um, um, we, we user have to kind of have the, the, the data for now or today or one hour ago or right now. Um, so you kind of have to deliver it to APIs and in, in live and in real time. Um, obviously both every recipe and every auto ML pipeline that we build internally also have this real-time uh, um, phase where the user wants to consume it because he has his user or his customer waiting in checkout or, or, or whatever. So we have real-time, but the complex processing and this kind of uh, understanding exactly what is the data and modeling it, this happens in batch. Let's now uh, move to something positive. Tell us about you know, something you're proud of, a big win. Uh, in your data work? So we have a big win. Um, so we, I think that modeling, data modeling, com kind of mo combining modeling with, um, with the right serving infrastructure is something, is a tool that we build internally um, that enables us to have a more quality um, matching capabilities over a very, a very you know, variety and complexity of, of data. So the, I think that the win was when, when we started onboarding more and more and more data sources and everything kind of, you know, you, know, you have this feeling when you kind of take the, this new uh, product to, produ you know, to production and it, it works. Um, and then a machine, kind of a reflect. working machine. A machine, yeah. So you kind of reflect and you say, okay, so it was worth investing all of this time, really understanding modeling, really understanding how, you know, you, data is always talking about something in the real world. Always there is something in the real world 
that generated this data. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're actually able to model the real world correctly, then somehow the data behind the scene kind of falls into place and everything kind of makes sense. And I think this is what we saw and this was really exciting. This is a project. I mean, initially we started talking about data engineers versus software engineers. And, you know, it, we often talk about uh, the boundaries sort of blurring between the two. So, so such a project where you built that super interesting flow, do you consider this a data engineering challenge, a software engineering challenge or both? And you know, which skill set did you need internally to deliver that? Wow. Yeah. So this, that's a question I, I actually talk to a lot of people a lot. But what is a data engineer and how is it different from being a software engineer or, or a big data developer? So I, I look at the developer world. You have software developers um, and you have software engineers and you have data developers and you have data engineers. Um, so I look on development, like writing logic versus engineering, which is, you know, construction, actually. In a, in a way, it's construction. Uh, foundations and you know understanding uh, things in, in in lower levels um, I think that the project and I think this is why we see you know we didn't have I don't I don't think that there was a data engineering podcast that you know so you're saying like in many ways do you you divide in like engineers into two groups those who are responsible to generate the data and uh, uh, and deliver it and those who build something on top of it I'm not sure. I, I, I'm honestly not sure where the line is because I'm also looking at the line between where is data engineer meeting ML engineer uh, or mm -hmm. meeting the software engineer. Are they the same person? Um, but I think essentially that the problem I was, I was talking about was a data engineering problem, essentially, because it had this element of uh, data model and schemas um, indexing how do you index data correctly? Mm. Uh, it had a lot of those elements uh, that I think makes it very data engineering. So kind of having these schemas and, 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 and model on one hand, but both, but understanding w which is the right infrastructure to kind of hold everything in place so it could scale natively. So I think it's a more of a data engineering problem. Any insight you can share on, you know, you talked a lot you mentioned quality a lot, data quality, and you know the importance of data being at high quality. How do you treat quality internally? You know within your data pipelines and flow and, and data stack. So, when you're thinking about you know finding the right data, right? When you when you kind of try to think, okay, my, my user want to use the platform to actually find the right data. Sometimes it doesn't even know that what is the right data. So. It kind of has two elements to it, I think. One of them, all of them are under quality in some in some form, but it has kind of the matching, um, the matching problem, uh, which is when when a user is coming and he's talking about a certain company or a certain place, okay, how do I know exactly on my data sets what is the, you know, how do I know how to match it? How to find the place, okay, the geography, the place that the user is talking about, or the organization that the user is talking about, or the combination between the two. So matching is a is one thing that leads. So we our approach there was enabling experimentation because um, it's very hard. It's it's you know it's very hard to get like ground truth mm -hmm. because almost every aspect of data that you look at has like those amazing, uh, you know, um, amazing challenges and complexities that only when you start, you know, getting your head, your, your hands dirty, you kind of understand what it is, what are they? Uh, um, so yeah, so matching really affects, really affects quality, obviously. Yes. Uh, we treat matching um, as, as an experiment, as understanding how do we um, how do we tune exactly in every case the system? And this is where you know enabling generalized system that that you know works well with metadata and enables 
enables like the data owners and the kind of the domain experts to change and tweak it and play with it kind of to 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 see that it fits with the real world or with ex their expectation so relying heavily on 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 domain experts here so this is one thing the other the, the other aspects are obviously are correctness so even if i found the right um the right organization the right place that the user was talking about um and i i want to get back points of interest for example so i need to make sure that if i said there's a coffee shop there then there is a coffee shop that the data is correct so i might i, I probably found the right place which is one thing but now i need to make sure that i retrieve back data that is correct mm -hmm. uh, correct and then you know after you did these two which are super complex you kind of have to ask yourself is this relevant so if my user is trying to predict the sales of his product or you know optimizing routes for uh, shipping or whatever is having a coffee place something that he needs to know maybe if there's a coffee place like in Tel Aviv people are stopping their car you know to get coffee and there's always a uh, you know cars tailing and always it takes five minutes more or whatever so you know there's those small nuances I think that uh, so combining all of those I think this is how we treat data quality Interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Um, what gets on your nerves the most in your daily work with data? Uh, what contributed the most to your hair growing a little bit wider? In, I mean, inconsistencies. We work with a lot of data vendors, and you can actually see vendors that that they, you know they own their data, and they provide consistent stream or consistent uh, um, delivery. Um, schemas are consistent. Um, file format, yo, file formats is that that's that that you know what I'm I'm rever I'm reverting my answer. File formats. It's 2021. <laughs> use compressed parquet. Use something with schema. It's not that hard, you know. I'm get you. You know, we were working with textual data, delimited with pipes and weird <laughs> stuff. You know, and, and you, you compressed with weird compression. So you kind of ask to say why. I mean, I think uh, you know that's a a good new corner we need in the, yes. in the podcast. Like, data formats, like not data formats. Just let people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just need let to off steam this, from yeah. the stuff they had because exactly. let's face it, data engineering has some pretty nasty parts in our day to day. Data yeah. counts uh, with the data bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the rant about your stuff you hate corner. Use Do you support uh, XML as a data source? <laughs> um, we have to, you know. <laughs> ah, wow, it's amazing. <laughs> nice. Wait, what were you saying? If you hear me, then. Then use a uh, compressed parquet, snappy or whatever. So let's uh, data engineers worldwide. Let's agree to use only that from this point forward, and it'll make our life Please easier. Please use fast decompression with snappy. That's the ask here. Standardized. Boom. Everyone That's that hears that, yeah, no zip, no <laughs> nothing else, just snappy. Uh, how do you stay on your toes in terms of you know being updated and uh, what's going on in the data world? Any sort of uh, tips on who, who to follow? Uh, Aside from the that? from this podcast. So I'm I'm an avid Googler when it comes to uh, um, to maintaining uh, my knowledge. I'm, I'm actually using uh, um, I'm, I'm following several. I'll try to find it, and, and, and but I'm using Daily Dev. I don't know if you know them. Mm -hmm. pretty, I think they're Israeli as well. Not sure. Um, so I use Daily Dev, which is kind of a Chrome uh, homepage that uh, connects me to really interesting uh, um, sources. Daily I'm Dev, following, okay. Yeah, I'm following several, so you probably know, awesome on Git, a lot of mm -hmm. awesome pages that are awesome data engineering, awesome ML ops, awesome ML engineering. So I'm following those. And so I'm, I'm trying to find projects to follow and, and kind of lead from there in a way. So one one example, and people make fun of me on that, but I'll say it anyway. Now I'll have it recorded. So I've been following. I don't know. You know Spark. Everybody knows Spark. 
and Spark. So I was following Spark as a project, and then I started following kind of the people behind Spark and the laboratory in Berkeley behind Spark, and then they emerged with this new laboratory that br brought us eventually Ray, which is a project that I've been following for, you know, two or three years. Mm -hmm. No one was talking about it, no one was using it, and, you know, um, a while ago, so I, I, you know, I'm kind of iterating back, and I was getting into the project again, and I'm saying, you know, they really made a progress, and they, you know, released a general, uh, you know, a general version, like the first product, you know, fully uh, production version. I mean, and that was, that was really exciting, and we started talking to the to the team behind it, and so I think it's a it's a lot there. Um, so finding those projects, and then trying to find a way to actually talk to the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything is searchable today, but talking to the people is great. You know, using like uh, Slack channels. I think those are the places where, where things get, where you actually able to, as you said, kind of be on your toes and be on the, on kind of the this verge. This is a huge change. Yeah. I think like the community and people aspect in data wow. engineering is huge. huge. I mean, much more than even generalized software engineering because it's space is growing so fast changing so quickly and unless you keep track and keep your eyes open to the open source projects to people talking about this and that you lose a lot of great things uh, and I think there's a lot of community power even without that being for formalized that impacts yeah. this the space we're in which makes it exciting I think yesterday for us yesterday we, we, we I have this whatsapp group of uh, data engineers and yesterday, someone asked a question about, you know, how do I process? I want to process this and that data, and the data is kind of, part, you know, partitioned this way and so on. And I was tagging Boaz, you know, I think it's a, it's a relevant case. Talk, you know, so this. Yeah, it, it's an interesting case. Maybe let's share with, with our listeners. So typically when we say about communities, you know, we talk about uh, all the, you know, the famous and open and big broadcasts. Uh, I mean, yeah. forums and sites we're on. Here we have some, some, you know, something very local to Tel Aviv, maybe, but there is sort of a local data engineering group on WhatsApp, which is sort of what is very popular here, for instant messaging. But it has become very, it's a very local but very effective group where local practitioners ask your daily, uh, you know, get advice on their daily challenges with data. So maybe you know, the tip from us would be localize more communities. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, worldwide. Sometimes, you know, if you're in the Valley, if you're in the East Coast, if you're in the West Coast, if you're here or there, uh, talk to people around you. They're always in the same time zone to hop on a quick call. It makes it a little bit more personal. Uh, yeah. So it's an interesting approach. Definitely worked well here for us. I think it well. makes a difference. Uh, you know, I'm not sure it has to be local, but it has to be a group where people feel comfortable enough to ask stupid questions sometimes. Exactly. And yeah. get very straightforward Stack Overflow, you know, top result answers. Um, so once you have that, you know, you have the right group because people are feeling comfortable and they will ask questions and, mm -hmm. and you know, discussion will move from there. Yeah, good, good point. Thank you. Um, okay, I think uh, we're almost done. Uh, any last famous words for, your, your, for our listeners? Listen to the data. <laughs> in a nice, way, nice. data engineers. You know, it's very obvious with data scientists and data analysts. But I think, you know, I came from data. I did a couple of years of data science, pure data science, mm -hmm. and got back. I actually got into data engineering by accident twice. So the beginning of my career, and then I kind of deviated toward data science, and then got back to data engineering again. Somehow, keeps pulling uh, you in. Yeah. It found me. I didn't found data engineering, but um, but listen to the data. So if if you if you if you are able to have data like the the understanding of the data scientist as an engineer, I think it makes it makes your life a lot easier. So listen makes to the data, and if you don't like what you hear, <laughs> cleanse it. Yeah. Listen to the data is great. It's uh, it's t-shirtable. Yes, it's abstract yeah. enough to be uh, debatable for hours. It's catchy. Well done, Roy. <laughs> okay, good. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for another episode. We'll see you next time. Thanks again, Roy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.